So um, it's my absolute honor and privilege to welcome Vincent and Bongi from SNG this morning to this um, guest lecture. We're very excited to have you. You know, Vincent, just um, if I, I'm going to get to um, all about you in a moment, but just to give you some context, um, mm -hmm. I, I just want to applaud the, the CTA students who literally went online overnight and um, just showed resilience and perseverance mm -hmm. and determination. We've been through mm -hmm. some some rocky times as as a group, mm -hmm. um, but they have just, it's amazing how they've just been flexible and agile in being able to do it. Um, I want to recognize my colleagues, especially the leadership of Prof Ben, who just Professor worked ben. with, it was just an absolute driving force in in getting us, us online. Um, the university itself has also been so supportive. I don't know if you're aware, but um, they've made data available quite quickly for all our ah, students on a monthly good. basis mm -hmm. to be able to access online material and engage in, in online classes and stuff. And we're very grateful to the powers that be at at UJ for, for just facilitating it and um, allowing us the freedom to, to be able to experiment with, with mm. different things. And I think we have learned a lot of lessons mm. um, about technology and how to incorporate that. You know, we talk about blended learning um, mm -hmm. and I think we're finally gonna get to, to really see what that means for us. And it was total, yeah. you know, trial mm. by fire. Um, so just to kind of give you the context that this has kind of become mm. the, the norm for us now and we're, okay. we're we're really excited to see you, but I would like to formally introduce you. So, ladies and gentlemen, um, I've actually known Vincent for a while. We actually marked yeah. at Psycho. We marked the ITC yes. together for a number of years. Um, yeah. Vincent has a background in lecturing, so he spent some time at UNISA, and he's mm -hmm. currently a, a director at um, SNG. I think if I if I remember right, Vincent, you've been a director there for the last um, five years, four, three years. Um, three years, there. that's right. Yes, mm. um, you you were appointed as partner as um, I think late 2017, and Correct. Vincent has a lot of experience, guys. You are very lucky to have someone of his stature here. He has served on numerous board committees the South African Institute of Chartered Accountants Audit and Risk Committee, the IPD Development Committee, um, Banking Sector Training Authority. Uh, he serves as an Independent Finance and Remuneration Committee, the South African State Theatre, so a man of many talents and many, many interests, <laughs> and the mm. Independent Police and Investigative Directorate on the Risk Committee as well, which you chair, as well as the Audit mm. Committee. So, you know, when I was just um, reading about all the other stuff about you, Vincent, you really... Um, you kind of represent what we talk about at UJ. We we have the sort of tagline that says "What's up," and it means who says accountants <laughs> are boring, and you uh. certainly aren't. Um, you show us that you don't just have to be all about the numbers. You can be such mm. a well-rounded individual. And thank you and Bongi for taking time out of what I know is a busy diary to just share mm. some thoughts and experiences with our students. So I'm gonna put off my video and my microphone and hand over to you. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vanessa, and thank you uh, for that introduction. Truly appreciate it. It's, a, it's an honor to be given this platform. Um, as a fam, um, this is something that we actually enjoy going around. We call it Bongi and I, who's joining me on this line. Bongi is one of our manager. We normally go around the country and actually give this um, guest lecture and the intention behind them is that they give us an opportunity to match the students theoretical knowledge with our practical experience and Bongi this is our very first one uh, we are doing virtually at yeah. the University of Johannesburg and we're actually yeah. excited about it normally you know you have an audience of students in an auditorium so to be able to have it in this manner and actually record it it would be, it, I think it's an interesting thing and it just shows how agile as the university uh, UJ has been in, you know, adopting and going ahead with this. So mm -hmm. we are excited, we are delighted to be here. And what we would do is that we would um, deliver our guest lecture and then we would allow you to do Q and A's. Um, so if you have questions, just put them in the Q and A right at the end. Bongi would help me in facilitating um, those um, Q&A questions. So I may go off my camera, so my video, so do not mind that. 
the intention there is just to get you to focus on the subject matter that we would be presenting. So thank you very much. And uh, um, we're going to start now. Thanks, everyone. Boingi, you'll stay on standby for me right till the end. Thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> All right, um, so what is it that we're going to speak about? Um, I have a slide there that speaks about the presenter, and I think Vanessa has done an exceptional work uh, just giving you a background of who I am and what I do. And in addition to that, I thought I'll take this opportunity to guest lecture to also tell you about our FAM, SNG Grand Thornton. And once I've done that and told you about our FAM, uh, we would proceed then to our actual guest lecture then. And what I'd be looking at, it's the impact of COVID on the audit engagements. And I'm excited about that. And you would see how we match the theory that you have with our practical experience and what we've experienced uh, as auditors on the ground. Okay, I'm trying to move to the next slide. All right, so now if I tell you about myself, that's the background that Vanessa has told you about. I'm not going to waste your time on this one, but I just want to tell you a bit on my professional interest as well as my personal interest is that on a professional level, the areas of interest that I have, it's in finance, uh, in governance and innovation. And uh, rightfully so in innovation, and I realize how the world is going and us as auditors, as you can imagine, I qualified many years ago, is that we have to be agile and understand how technology is influencing uh, the future. And, and the moment right now as well. And as a result, to upskill myself, I enrolled uh, myself for a course with GIPS so that you know, I can understand about you know, digital transformation and how that takes place and how it affects everyone so that I can take those skills and apply them into my professional environment, especially when we start looking at our strategy within the FAM. So those are the areas of my interest when you look at a professional interest. And someone might be wondering on the line and say, but Vincent, what about an audit? You're an auditor. Yes, audit is there and it's covered as part of governance. As you can imagine, governance is quite broad and audit is embedded in there. As Vanessa said, and I like your tagline, Vanessa, with SERP, is that I also have personal interests, and those interests include travel. Um, I, I just love to experience different cultures, different people, you know, different environments. I think there's lots of growth in that because that's another form of learning and opening up your mind to what you might not know. And uh, I've traveled quite extensively, and I've had that privilege, and I'm happy that, you know, I've been blessed in that manner. And I have two boys, and uh, I travel with them, and we try and keep quite fit and do uh, lots of outdoor activities. That includes hiking and cycling. Uh, I normally say to them with cycling, I do it socially, and they want to do it professionally. By all means, you can go. I'm all right with competition. I'm just okay doing my 10, 15 Ks, but they want to do that. Um, as an accountant, I'm just, I don't think, and Vanessa, you're right, you know, it's just about being in a square. There's quite... Uh, a, a broad sense of what one can be. And I think it's great when we can bring all those aspects of what makes us humans. And as human as I am, you'd realize that I'm also on social media and those are the social media platforms that you can find me. So at least now this gives you a bit of a background as to who I am and what I'm about and what my interests are. And I think that will then ease us nicely into telling you about the fan and why I also chose to be part of SNG Grand Thornton, because I believe I'm culture fit uh, for the fam. So just as a background is that SNG Grand Thornton is a member fam of Grand Thornton International Limited. And that is great because it gives us a global footprint. Very important is that we are the largest indigenous South African audit and advisory fam. And we are proud of that. You know, we always speak about homegrown and being home brewed. And then this is a fam that is, you know, homegrown and home brewed, and then just has an international footprint. 
Um, our firm is led by Mr. Victor Segese, that's him that you can see in the uh, picture. He is our chief executive. Um, he's a great man with great ideas and great minds who actually has been with the firm for a number of years, and we have seen a great growth under his leadership as a firm. And as a firm, we work in teams uh, to help dynamic organization um, to unlock the potential for growth and providing meaningful and forward-looking advice. That's what we do as a firm, and, and we're excited about the type of clients that we serve and the work that we do. All right, and now when you look at our local footprint, um, is that we are present in each and every province in the country. We very present. And then in Gauteng here is that we have two offices in Gauteng, uh, one being in Johannesburg Woodmead and the other being here in Pretoria, Menlin. And we have some of the good news that I must share with you right out of the box. I think you are the first people to hear this as students, is that on the 1st of September 2020, KPMG Eswatini joined SNG Grand Thornton. So we acquired uh, the KPMG Eswatini office and became a member of us. And this means we now have presence as SNG Grand Thornton in Eswatini, previously known as Swaziland. And we are very excited about this because it gives us as a firm the opportunity to uh, cement our position as a firm in the Southern African market. So those are exciting news for us as a firm. So what makes SNG Grand Thornton different? Uh, we believe as a firm and our uh, chief executive, uh, Victor Segesa, also believes this. And then that's what drives the firm, is that we have the ability to use different technologies in serving our clients. Uh, this has been evident during the lockdown, as you can imagine, where we have been able to use our technologies to remotely service our clients quite seamlessly and efficiently. So that's what we are able to do, and we are excited about that. Um, we also have experience in working with international clients. So not only a local fair, but we also bring an international fair because of our experience. We have a very diverse workforce as a firm, and this uh, provides us with the ability to interact with our clients in many languages and also being mindful of different cultures. So that is really great for us and that we are committed to value and excellence. Excellence within our firm is what drives us and we are very uh, passionate about that. In terms of international footprint, um, within the network, we operate in 135 countries and we have just over 50,000 people. In South Africa, our numbers are sitting at about 1.1 thousand. So we, we're very excited and looking forward to much more growth as a fan. So what are the, some of the clients that we have? Right there you see a list of some of our clients and our clients are both in private and public sector. Uh, in private sector, we have a variety of clients, including listed entities. These uh, clients in the uh, private sector include uh, sectors such as financial services, telecoms, mining, logistics, healthcare, and, and the list goes on, as you can see from there. In the public sector, the portfolio is also diverse and includes clients in higher education, including um, the University of Johannesburg and other sectors. Uh, for example, we have clients such as the Reserve Bank, IDC, ESCOM, uh, Telcom, and so on. So our portfolio is actually quite huge. So if you have not signed up with any firm as yet, we would be happy if you can contact our firm and join us to be part of this. So you can gain experience in this diverse portfolio of our clients. Um, right at the end, I'll provide you with the details of how you can be in touch with us as a firm. All right, so I'll take a pause there just for a second. And now I am also excited that I can just share my experiences with you about what's been happening on the ground. 
And those experiences it's as a result of what my topic is in relation to this guest lecture. And it is the impact to look at the impact of COVID-19 on audit engagements, right? That's what we would be looking at. In order to do that, I must just give you a bit of background into COVID. And it's really a refresher of some of the information that you may know. As you know, is that um, in South Africa, we had a declaration of COVID as a state disaster on the 15th of March, 2020, when President Cyril Ramaphosa came on TV and addressed us as a nation. As a result of that, the are economic consequences due to the national lockdown and the effective date of the national lockdown is that, you know, is that it took place on the 26th of March, 2020. So that's when, you know, we had a national lockdown. And I think all of us, we went into it, having read about it, but living it, you'd agree with me, it's been different. Uh, I suppose two, three days into lockdown, uh, we, you know, we saw that. And the dates are very important in the work that we do. And for you as a student, especially when you start being assessed, is that you need to be mindful of dates. So I'm mentioning this dates to you for a reason. More particularly is that I'm interested, and you should be paying attention, to the date of the 26th of March, 2020, when the national lockdown was being implemented. We would agree that, you know, COVID-19 is an unprecedented, um, has presented us with unprecedented challenges for humanity and for the global economy. Uh, the effect of it are subjective and have significant levels of uncertainty. And this levels come of uncertainty come in the form of a short term and long term in nature. On the short term side of it is that we have seen a reduction of trade in activity, right? And the disruption of supply chain because of why the restrictions that came with what? With lockdown. On the long term effects, and I think we are to see the effects of it, we start feeling it now, is that there would be an increase in unemployment rate. And that is concerning for us in terms of growing the economy. So in order for me then to look at this effects of uh, COVID-19 on audit engagements, I thought then I would look into three industries and give you a bit of background in those. We'll look at the education industry, how COVID has had an impact. I'll then look into the ICT, and then I'll look at gaming and hospitality. And I'll tell you, the challenges that the auditors have had, management have had, and things that the auditors had to consider when the lockdown became effective on the 26th of March, 2020. So let's go right into it. As you would have guessed it, I thought if I look at the education industry, it would make it even more appropriate to look at University of Johannesburg as itself. I wonder how many of you have had a chance to actually read up the annual report of the University of Johannesburg. It makes a fascinating read. And I'd encourage you as students as well, so that you can see the things that you are studying, how they actually make sense in, in reality. So we know that the University of Johannesburg, it's in the education industry. The year end of the University of Johannesburg it's the 31st of December, 2019. The audit report for that year end that we're gonna be looking at is uh, 7 July, 2020. That's when the audit report for the financial year end, 31st of December, 2019 was signed. It was signed on the 7th of July, 2020. So as you can imagine, and I want you to think with me here, is that some of the audit work uh, including planning and test of controls and, you know, looking at such things and maybe some substantive testing might have been done during the financial year of 2019, right? 
And then again this year, and looking at the audit report when it was signed, is that then the audit work must have taken some time between the period Jan 2019 up until 7 July, I mean Jan 2020, up until 7 July 2020 when the audit report was signed. And in the middle of the audit, as you would imagine, then we are in a lockdown. That's on the 26th of March. So the auditors then had to go back and look at certain areas. The first area they were looking at because of the uncertainty that came with COVID-19 when it was implemented. I appreciate that right now where we're sitting, we, we have better information. But then you can imagine even on 7 July when the auditor signed the audit report, they did not have much information. What the information you know, changes every day, the developments are different all the time. I remember when the levels were being introduced, I thought we would not get to level one this year. That's what I thought. I thought maybe sometime next year, and here we are. And it just shows how information changes and affects us on the audit. And we have to be, um, make decisions and, you know, and move on because we can't, we can't you know, hold on audits forever and ever. So what are the areas that the auditors would be concerned with? And, and we'll go into it is that they'd have to look at the going concern of the University of Johannesburg. And in looking at the University of Johannesburg going concern, in addition, is that they would have to look at the events after the reporting day. Why the events after reporting day? Is that, like I said to you, the year end, dates become very important. The year end that we're looking at here, it's 31 December 2019. And then, what are we looking at? We are looking at, you know, uh, 26 March, right? 2020, national lockdown coming in, activities of trading come to cease. So the question becomes, if we look at the impact of COVID-19 at the 31st December 2019 at the University of Johannesburg, am I dealing with an adjusting or non-adjusting event? Just think about it right? And if you think about it, then you guess it correctly, is that it's definitely a non-adjusting event, IS-10. Because that event happened after year end, does not provide any information about that something that happened during year end. Yes, someone might say, but Vincent, no, in December, we, we knew that there was a virus in Wuhan, China. Yes, but not in South Africa. UJ, it's here in South Africa, has its operations here in South Africa. But in South Africa, the real effects of the virus were felt from March onwards, right? So as a result, we are dealing with a non-adjusting event. So what are the auditor's responsibility looking in this area? First of all, we have to look at the risk that we have attached to our going concern and maybe consider increasing it to how we ordinarily would have had it. Because ordinarily, we know the universities are going to be there. We know in the budgets that, you know, uh, the Minister of Finance allocates certain funding to the universities, you know. So, so all of that, we have known that, you know, the, the concern about going concern is very minimal. But all of a sudden, with the introduction of COVID-19, we become very concerned about, hmm, what's the viability of the university? And that's where we start looking at the going concern. The other area that we may not have even thought much about is to say mm, qualitative aspects and not maybe quantity because we've agreed that this is not an adjusting e event. Is that on a qualitative aspect, we probably have to look at the disclosure in relation to events after the reporting date. So we've looked at our risk assessment. As auditors, we don't just identify a risk and do nothing about it. We need to respond to it. Right, And as a part of our response is that we would request management to do an assessment for going concern. Right? That would be their budgets and all of that. Ordinarily, in a university environment, management would do it anyway. Because for them to get a budget from government, they, a, a, a funding from government, they need to present a budget. But that budget now, what becomes tricky is that it's not business as usual. Now there's this COVID-19 uncertainty. So you need to factor in the impacts of COVID in those budgets that management is making. So management had to go back and adjust and do all those things, right? So as you can imagine, here we are working remotely, everything is going on, management is doing that. 
And then we would have to then go again and substantively test that going concern assessment, paying attention to these assumptions that management would have applied. So in the education sector, at the University of Johannesburg in particular, for the 31 December 2019, this would be the key areas that auditors would have concerned themselves with and have to look at from a COVID perspective, right? So what I've done to demonstrate to you is that I took an extract uh, from the UJ 31 December 2019 apps on the going concern note. And I just want you to look at that. And you would see here, management says the following. They say the university's focus and projections take account of reasonably possible changes in operating circumstances. And what are those circumstances? They're looking at the ability to operate within its current financing for the foreseeable future, right? So you can see now, they say, you have to look at what's happening right now and look at our budget. And it goes on further, they say, because of COVID-19, several scenarios were modeled on potential impact on the cash operation, as well as financial sustainability. And that's what we would have to look at as auditors as well, because let's look at different scenarios. You do scenario planning, because there's so much uncertainty involved here. And we have to be comfortable when we express an opinion to say this financial statements fairly present, and we are happy that they've been pre prepared on a going concern basis. It goes further. They say the worst case scenario would emanate in the instance of the government diverting funds to areas directly affected by the effects of the pandemic, e.g. health, and thus no longer making subsidy payments. Remember I told you that the university gets subsidy from government and that gets approved in the budget when the minister comes and tables the budget in February and the mid one, uh, normally it happens in October, right? That's what would happen. But in this instance, we don't know that, okay, are we still gonna get money at the university? The university management is really concerned. And us as auditors, we are concerned about what's gonna happen because at the time there's lots of uncertainty. We don't know. However, you'll see management goes on. It says, uh, well, they have however considered a remote possibility given that no pronouncements have been made as yet by the government. And that's what really it is. And you would see for the user of this financial statements that transparent information has been provided with regards to going consent. And for management to come and conclude this, the auditor would have looked at that assessment and documented in their working paper all those procedures that you know you need to perform in relation to going consent. We would have done them on our job, right? And then furthermore, another note from the Fs that you may be interested in, it's on subsequent events, right? And then we agreed that this is not what? This is not an adjusting event. And management says that. And then you see, management have carefully considered the impact of COVID-19 and measures have been put in place to ensure the continuous delivery of services. So they tell us about how they have served you as students. And Vanessa also spoke about it to say as the university, you were agile enough you know, to, to move on to online, to provide data and all of that. And I must applaud your students to be able to adjust with that as well. And that also for us demonstrates your agility. Another skill that your future employer is looking for, for candidates, including ourselves as SNG Grant Thornton, right? So that is what the effects of COVID have had in the education sector and in this environment, you would see that, you know, I've raised it particularly uh, for the University of Johannesburg. I noted that there is a hand raised. If I may ask that, you know, we pack the questions and then at the end, I will deal with all the questions and then we can engage further on. I'll allow enough time for that. All right. Now let's Sorry, go. Vincent. Um, yes, uh, Bongi. Yes, um, as well, there's a Q&A session, so you can just put through your questions in there um, so okay. that I would be able to note them as well as we go on. Excellent. Thank you. Yes, if we can also use the Q&A, because Boing is going to assist me in monitoring that, and we'll be able to share some of those questions with everyone so that we are all part of it and there's a great learning 
for everyone on this part. Okay. All right. So now we'll move to the next part, another industry. And that is information and communications technology. And that is telecom. We are looking now at telecom. Telecom's year end is 31 March 2020 that you would be looking at. You'd see different from the university where the university is 31 December, remember, 2019. The audit report of telecom was signed on the 20th of June, 2020, right? So now let's think about it. So during the lockdown, when it was announced again on the 26th, management at Telcom had to worry about closing their books, isn't it? Because year end, then they had to do it remotely. And thanks to a cloud service um, accounting softwares, because it's able to enable you to do that, enables the auditors as well to work remotely, right? That's where we are. And there's Telcom doing all of that. And as auditors as well, what happens? Become very concerned to say, what impact would this have? Number one, like anywhere else, didn't matter who you were really, is that going concern needs to be considered. And with regards to COVID-19, IS-10, events after the reporting day, is that now for telecom, it's a little bit different. How so? Because now the event happened on the 26th of, um, of March, the national lockdown implementation, we know that, right? And the year end happened, you know, 31, uh, about five days later, then that's what happened, right? So you would agree here, we have an adjusting event, even by those small number of days, it is an adjusting event in telecom's books. The very first thing that telecom would worry about, it's the valuation of trade uh, receivables, your expected credit losses, and I'll speak in detail on those. That's an area that they would be worried about. And the other things they'd be worried about, it's the estimates, the provisions, you know? So those are the things, other estimates other than ECL, you know, that they are worried about. So over and above the normal going concern that we've seen in the case of UJ, now Telcom now has an adjusting event because of the timing of how everything happened here. So what are the responsibilities again here for the auditor? Of course, going concern, just look at the risk assessment there. And there, now we have to look at the risk that we had given to the valuations of our receivables your expected credit losses. That's an area I would look at. And then we also have to look at other estimates because estimates is an area of judgment and in an area where management may engage in what? Uh, you know, fraudulent financial reporting activities. I'm not saying a telecom management did that. I'm just telling you of possibilities that may exist. So we are concerned about management override of controls. So what, how do we then respond to this risks? Number one, we have to heighten our professional skepticism, right? Our professional skepticism now, you know, has to be heightened. That's what we have to do. With regards to our ECL, and this is what we normally do on our audits, because of the complexities of the actual model is that we do engage experts. Uh, the experts that we engage there to look at the ECL model, normally it's actuaries that are firm. We use actuaries to assist us there and would have to substantively test, of course, our receivables, provision, going consent assessment. You'd find that depending on our risk, if the risk assessment for receivable and estimates has changed is that our substantive testing may increase as well. And that's part of our response. And this is the difference now between, you know, when we had a non-adjusting event as a result of COVID to now having an adjusting event as a result of COVID. So these are the areas of concerns and this is where we find ourselves, right? So now if, 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 if we are here and at, at Telcom and we looked at all of this, management goes and makes additional adjustments and whatnot, we become very concerned, we become very concern, concern from an audit perspective about the audit evidence that we need to acquire to enable us to express an audit opinion, right? And then I'll show you again in the instance of Telcom, an extract from their apps and what management had considered. And this is where we are. And this is an extract in the apps. And then at, at Telcom, management said the following. They said, 
Additional, additional, guys, very important. It was not planned. Impairment of trade receivables and contract assets due to COVID-19 impacted the last two weeks of the financial year end, right? They say that. They say that, right? The contract assets will include, for example, at Telcom, where you go and get a contract. There are fees that are being incurred there and all of that. So they get capitalized and, um, uh, and, and realized over a period of time. So that's what would be involved. And then they go on. They say COVID-19 has been concluded as an adjusting post-balance sheet event for companies with a year end of 31 March 2020. So guys, even if you're in the exam, now I'm giving you an exam technique, and then you know where COVID happened, and you know your year end, come on. It tells you there, that's what would happen for such year end. Say so it's, it's adjusting. So the thinking there should not be too much. You should be ending your marks and passing there, right? And management goes further and says, the negative impact of COVID-19 on the South African economy is expected to put further pressure on consumers with studies predicting that a number of customers are likely to default on their obligation as they fall due. And what did Telcom do? They say they took a prudent approach in line with SICA's guidelines by estimating an increase in the default rates on the customer's base. This has been incorporated in the calculation of the group's expected credit loss. And they tell us now, they say the total provision, guys, at Telcom, it's 1.140 million. That's a huge amount. Of which 626 million is additional impairment that they ordinarily would not have. And as you can imagine, will affect their profits, right? And decrease their assets. So that's what it is. And this is what we see when we start seeing that what impact COVID has had. And now this is where we see companies would, you know, have lower profits than they predicted. Their asset base, balance sheet base will be much weaker than it has been uh, anticipated. And this is an example if you look at telecom. And those have been the issues at telecom, right? So we've looked at two industries now, the education using UJ, the ICT using telecom. Now, let's go to the next industry and our last industry. And that industry... It's in gaming and hospitality. And I am looking at Sun International. When we think of Sun International, guys, what should come up in your mind? Sun City in Rustenburg, Northwest. The new Maslow Hotel here in Pretoria in Menlin May, right? So that's Sun City. They must be thinking gambling and all of that. That's Sun International, rather. That's, that's Sun International. Let's look at Sun International. Very interesting one. The year end for Sun International, it's 31 December 2019 that we'll be looking at. And then the audit report date, I know say there I say year end, but it's audit report date was actually on the 16th of March 2020, just before national lockdown. So some of the work the auditors must have completed quite speedily in 2019 right? And then some of remaining work, they do roll forwards and all of that. They had to be done in 2020. And there they are. And as you can imagine, uh, Sun International is listed on JSE. And in terms of JSE regulation, you have to produce your financial statements within three months after your year end, right? They need to be published. So, I mean, there's a tight deadlines there that the auditors have to look at and when we do our planning and think about how we do our work. So there they are. We're looking at that, right? So very important is that now the auditor, you're thinking there's a lockdown, there's issues being raised here. And auditor's responsibility after the Fs have been issued, right? So now you have to consider with the information that we have now, are the financial statements misleading? And the auditors must have assessed that they are not, right? With the information that they had at the time, they are happy with the financial statements as they were, right? And as they were, it did not have an impact of whether to withdraw or amend financial statements. So those financial statements, even at that time, uh, say nothing about COVID because no one anticipated this. As you can imagine, the build up and the build up and boom, all of a sudden, lockdown, 
right? So you can imagine being an auditor in such an uncertain environment and the impact that COVID has had and the things that we had to deal with, right? In this instance, we've issued our audit report. We did look at, at financials and whatnot and information that has been presented and we are comfortable and happy with that information. Very interestingly though, is that about a week ago, um, Sun International published their 30 June uh, 2020 interim results as required by JSE regulation. Those results uh, were not audited. They were unaudited results. What management highlighted in those results, it's going concern, it's loan covenants, it's valuation of trade receivables, expected credit losses again, same as telecom, and other estimates, right? Provisions, etc. So that is where they found themselves. And then for, for transparency, I'll share with you what management is saying they are doing and considering, right? Because the yes, Assam International is still there, it's still operating. They now had to go back and look at their strategy and revise it a bit. So this is what they are disclosing as management as part of their unaudited results, which they have published. They say, number one, they are engaging with the lenders to look at, you know, uh, servicing their debts and looking at a uh, uh, covenants waiver. So let me tell you what happens normally is that a business would go to a financial institution and apply for a loan, right? And then the financial institution would say, we'll be able to give you this loan. But in order to give it to you, you must maintain a following, uh, for example, um, current ratio, debt to equity ratio, certain profitability, certain margins. So those would be part of what we call loan covenants, right? And then what happens is that if you um, contravene any of those loan covenants, the debt becomes payable immediately. So you can imagine with the financial situation, at uh, um, Sun International, I mean, they haven't been trading for the longest of time. They've lost quite a bit in this period. And, and you know how they've been affected, people in hospitality industry. In that way, they had to go and be proactive and engage with lenders to say, but look where we are. And that's part of strategy. I see some of those questions and strategy coming through where you have to advise, you know, what management should do. And here I am. Uh, you know, giving you what is really happening on the ground and what businesses are doing. In addition, guys, apart from, you know, going on and discussing with your lenders to waiver uh, those covenants, is that they had to look at their short-term liquidity risk. And as part of that is that there is 60% reduction, up to 60% in payroll costs. So you can imagine people are not getting their full salaries. And it's just in the spirit of making a business work because without liquidity, guys, you have no business. You're not able to pay your people. So instead of not paying everyone or cutting jobs, how about we say we take a salary cut? That's the reality of how COVID has affected many businesses. And we see it in this business as well. And then they had to defer some of their capital investments, which were not critical. And then they had to also look in addition with their service providers and suppliers, a waiver or a reduction or deferment of some payments to say, we know we owe you and we should be paying on a monthly. How about you give us a year period, holiday payment as one would call it, right? To allow, you know, uh, liquidity in our business. And what they're doing, it, very important is that they're engaging government, regulators, customers, suppliers and staff. You can imagine your staff as your strategic asset as an organization and they're not getting their sal full salary and you still expect them guys to do their best and give the best service for the sustainability of, of the business that you can't ignore them. And those are the things that you, look, you need to look at. They started closing the non-core or selling rather the non-core assets. And as part of that, they've closed uh, um, Naledi San in Tabanchu, Bloemfontein, and Saran Karausel uh, here in Temba, just outside Pretoria in the Northwest province, right? 
And what they've done to raise funds as well is that they've concluded a 1.2 billion rights offer. So those are the, some of the things that they tell you. And this is where you see the impact of COVID-19, right? Obviously the auditors didn't look at this result, but as you can imagine, come the uh, 31 December uh, 2020 year end, this would be part of areas that the auditors will pay attention to, right? So guys, and I hope this has been beneficial to you and has given you an overview of what really we, you know, we're dealing with as auditors with regards to COVID-19. Uh, Boingi, thank you very much. I would pause here and you can lead me uh, for any comments and questions that are coming through. Um, all right, Vincent. Um, so I have only two questions with me on my side. And um, this young professional has, is going into, you know, a very practical space of how we are dealing with certain things in the, uh, within the audits to say, how are, we, how are we actually communicating, you know, when there's additional work that needs to be done or carried out at the, with our clients and, you know, whether when what happens or what the next step is when we come across audit issues um, of going concern uh, because of the impact of COVID, but our client believes ad otherwise in that regard. Okay, thank you, Bongi, and thank you for that question. It's really relevant. So when we are on, on an audit, we are in continuous engagement with management. So we are never in a way isolated from management. The beauty about the scope increase as it happened here is that management would be aware of it because even they themselves had to go and do additional work and revise their budget, budgets and do scenario play. So when we tell them in that scenario play, which ordinarily would not have been there, you know, we would also need to look at and do our own assessment, right? So those are the things that the auditors would need to discuss. And you know what it does, guys, in addition to that, is that it comes at cost because then I need to keep my staff on an engagement longer than, you know, we plan to. So though that is what this does. So we are in continuous, so it's never a surprise and management doesn't know. We are in continuous and bongi, you know, uh, engagement with management throughout the audit because they are the ones that understand their business very well because they deal with this matters on a daily basis. Thank you, Bongi. Uh, I hope I've answered that adequately. Uh, I don't know if you wanna add or we can take another question. Um, thanks for that, Vincent. I think you covered it quite adequately. The continuous communication between us and management makes it such that no one is surprised by any audit issues that we come across or any additional work that we have to do because of the circumstances that um, arise. Um, so other young professionals here are asking about um, how the first one is on if SNG has merged with BDO and would they then need to apply through a link that we give them to, for a training contract or through BDO. Um, so I think maybe you can start with that one, Vincent, before we go into the next question. Okay. Uh, thank you, Bongi. Uh, the only BDO office that we matched with, it's in East London, and that transaction took place already last year. Uh, so there isn't any measure. Uh, the other BDO transaction that happened many years ago uh, when we became a member firm of uh, Grant Thornton is that the Grant Thornton Johannesburg office is the one that matched with BDO and is known as BDO. And we remain uh, SNG Grant Thornton in South Africa. Uh, depending on your firm of preference, you know, you'd apply at the, at, at, in, in, in those firms' website. Ours is a SNG Grant Thornton, and I'll be sharing the details. Uh, so there isn't any other Grant Thornton in South Africa other than SNG Grant Thornton. Thank you, Bongi. Next question. Okay. Thank you for that, Vincent. So the next question is um, also based on a more practical experience perspective as to how uh, our company, SNG GT, 
has helped the first years adapt to the work environment because they didn't have much time in the office and then they were forced into a remote working uh, experience without any uh, experience of the practicalities of auditing. Mm. Uh, interesting, Bongi. I know you and I actually last week we were talking about this, yeah. right? So ordinarily when uh, a first year comes in is that, you know, there is induction. But in this instance, and to address the specific concern that's being addressed, that's being issued here, is that, you know, remote working. Uh, most people in our firm had not <laughs> worked remotely, you know. And I say most, maybe partners and managers we may have been able to. But trainees ordinarily, Bong, you'd agree that, mm -hmm. you know, they, we've been office based. So it was not only a shock in the system for first years, although it might have been much more felt because of their limited work experience. I mean, they had about two months at the time. What we've done as the firm, and Bongi, you can speak more into this because you're closer to it, is that mm. we've provided at the firm level tools to all our staff to enable them to work remotely, right? IT tools, data, softwares, cloud-based softwares, all of that, we provided that. We also moved our training um, uh, virtually so that we allow that transitioning. And we started off by looking at the mental state of our people. We have a department called People and Culture within our FEM, and they provided activities uh, for our staff members for mental health to allow with the transitioning. Bongi, I'll allow you mm -hmm. to add more on this on the ground with regards to the check-ins and everything that is being done. Yeah. Um, thank you, Vincent. So as well, um, like Vincent has mentioned, we've been provided with various tools that are allowing us to interact remotely um, on a daily basis. Yeah, of course, it is challenging to um, move from an environment where you would be able to sit with someone right next to you and be able to go through certain things and, you know, gauge their facial expressions and understand if they're actually getting what you're saying and, and all of that. But um, when we moved into the remote working space, we, we had the teething issues, but then we got into uh, the environment, we got into getting used to it, and our experience became a bit better in that regard. We are able to do calls via Zoom, via Teams, we're able to share screens while we're explaining things to each other. And what, is, what it has just made sure that we do is communicate, communicate, communicate. So we are speaking more frequently. Um, yes, sometimes you'd find that one is in a meeting, the other is in another meeting, and then there's those conflicts. But we are, move, we are in a space where we are communicating more frequently. And it's very important to also be responsible for your own professional development. So if you are stuck with something or if you have questions to ask, you don't you don't rest on those questions and try to figure everything out yourself. Um, you make sure you communicate again and say, I know we spoke about this in the morning, but let's, let's rehash it again now. Is this what we, what we were trying to do, you know? So it's all about communication, communication, communication. Um, a lot of our first years came in properly during the March period. So a lot of them didn't, didn't even understand what it is to be in an office environment fully yet. So I think to comment them, they adapted quite quickly to the remote working environment because it was almost the only working environment that, that they understood. But yeah, I hope that uh, answers your question. Mm, I think it does, Bongi. Thank you for that detailed uh, explanation of how we are uh, transitioning. We, of course, learning as well as we go along on areas to improve on and as we do yes. our surveys with our people just to see how we can better work. And, and yes, uh, Vanessa also spoke about the blended work uh, 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 teaching. We're also looking at uh, uh, a blended um, uh, hybrid model of working mm. as well. Mm. Mm. Next question, Bongi. Um, so the next question, I'm going to merge, I think, three questions that I've seen about this particular topic. So mm -hmm. it is going into wait, quite a few questions, actually, about audit fees um, based on the going concern risks that the clients are facing, the possibility that they might not be able to pay um, their audit fees. 
uh, how are we dealing with this from a pre-engagement perspective and any discussions with the clients we're having about fees and you know what the clients are requiring or are asking of auditors in terms of our audit fees mm, very good question so um the first thing that we need to note is that uh if the client is not able to pay the audit fee, it's a big risk indicator of the ability to continue as a going concern. A very huge indicator, because if they are not able to pay the audit fees, we are very concerned about such things as payroll, right? Payroll, it's the biggest expense in most organization. Are they even able to, right? to look at that, right? There are various risks. We have a risk a department within our firm that we engage when we are faced with that. And uh, then we are able to assess the impact of that inability of not being able to pay the audit fee. Um, so very often is that the client would be able to, right? Unless it's a very, very uh, small client that is really needs to close down those instances, it's where you can actually find that the client is not able to. Others are able to pay you, but at a later time. And you know, they'll say, we won't pay you immediately, we'll pay you after six months or before you start the next audit. So what we do practically is to assess that risk because we do get that client to sign an engagement letter, which is a contract. And in there, we do speak about when we expect audit fees to be paid. And if there are any challenges, they would highlight it there before they even sign the engagement letter. Thank you, Bongi. Okay, thank you for that, Vincent. Um, I'll also just ask this question that one of our young professionals is asking around um, Sun in the Sun International scenario that we took them through. Um, saying that as it was deemed that it was fair to not reflect the events as an unadjusting event and so far as an international concern. Um, as the auditors, how do we ensure fair representation uh, uh, is ensured by the particular company if, uh, and that Sun International doesn't unfairly down downplay the effects of COVID in their financial statements in the following years of, finance, of the financial statements, especially since in that instance, COVID would have been an impact to them already from the beginning of the year. So I think basically just ensuring future um, appropriate disclosure mm, so far as okay. COVID is concerned. So, and I think that's, that's very good uh, uh, thinking there, because if you think about it, Sun International, year end would have been 31 December 2019. Same as the University of Johannesburg, we agreed that for those year ends in South Africa, uh, those are non-adjusting events. So even if COVID happened, it, it would have been a non-adjusting event. The only thing that one can think of that COVID might have impacted, it's the going concern assessment, right? That management would have put forward, right? And mm -hmm. even after the audit, I suspect that management might have engaged, uh, I mean, auditors would have engaged management just to see their scenario planning. Uh, play. And then after looking at that scenario play, then the conclusion must have been reached after uh, lots of consultation and reading, and, you know, that we do as auditors, Bongi, uh, to conclude that we are happy with those financial statements as they are. But what they would do is that in six months time, they would detail how COVID has impacted them. And you would see if you look at, and I'll encourage the students to actually go download it, the interim results of Sun International for 30 June 2020 year end. I mean, it gives a clear, evident picture and there's transparency in it, you know? So as auditors, when we come in, and like I, I said as well, is that, you know, for the 31 December 2020 year end, we obviously would have to look at that in detail. Concerns would be on ECLs, those covenants, going concern, estimates applied by management, you know? So that would be heightened. And what I also suspect is that why the interim results were not reviewed and are unaudited, it's because of timing as well that they were under, but JSE regulation does allow for all of that. 
Thank you, Pony. Yeah. Okay. Um, so also our colleagues are now asking, uh, moving in uh, with about the fact that since ITC seems to be going, uh, the dates for writing ITC seem to be moving forward into the March, maybe April 2021 space. When uh, is the firm looking into bringing in first years to start uh, with their work? As you know, usually they would start after writing ITC in January and then would um, would come in would come yeah. in after they've written ITC. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's something that we're looking at as a firm, and I'll uh, I'll speak about that later. I think what's also important to note is that from a firm perspective, we don't hire you for having passed or written ITC. We want you having passed CTA, uh, unless there are candidates who are going to write supplementary next year, Jan, for the University of Johannesburg. But everyone else who passes this year, they would know and would hire. And we'll just look at how we bring them on board and also support them for ITC. Bongi, I see we are above time. What we would Ooh. do is that, yeah, we will take uh, the rest of the questions and then we would respond to them um, uh, as, as we go along, if that's okay with everyone, even post uh, this session. Uh, so yeah. just... Um, sorry, Vincent. Mm -hmm. Sure. We actually have two, well, one question left rather, and it's just about sure. how our okay. view is for, your, for the future now that the restrictions have been lifted and if we're continuing with remote working and uh, moving away from virtual to home-based uh, slash yeah. home-based working environment yeah. or are we expecting to go back into the office? Yeah. Yeah. That's essentially okay. the last question. Um, yeah. So I haven't been to the office in a long <laughs> time. I think six months or more. Yeah. I was telling you, Bongi. Um, yeah. So what we're looking at as a firm is uh, at the blended approach, you know, a hybrid model where, you know, we, there are people who go into the office certain days and all of that. We're investigating that quite a bit. I know I've actually done an extensive research with a survey that we've done for the firm. So there's a proposal that we've put forward. And it doesn't only affect uh, things as the working environment uh, in terms of coming to the office and all of that. It affects things including your leave policies, the way we bill our clients, and uh, as soon as that information is readily available, we'll be able to share with everyone. And what is very important in looking at that, point is that we are mindful that not everyone has a home that is conducive for working. And in that instance, we do open our offices to employees to use them, right? Bongi, I know you went to the office on Saturday to go and work, <laughs> right? So, so that's what we're looking at as a fan, a blended approach. Uh, more than it is actually uh, going back to the way things are. Because I think then we'd be going forward. We need to look at the future with optimism. And I'm really optimistic about the future and where it's going. And, uh, you know, that's what we're looking at as a fan, you know, and efficiency in how we do our work. So that's what I'm excited about. 100%. Thank you, Vincent. Okay. I think the rest is just thank yous from the guys. So we can, yeah. we can round up. Yes, and thank you to everyone who's been able to listen to this uh, session. And thank you to Vanessa, to Proven and Andre for inviting us um, as SNG Grand Fountain. We are indeed um, uh, excited. And uh, thank you so much for your time. And the candidates who are interested in our firm, there is an online application platform they may use. And in addition, our recruitment team has asked me to tell you about the following. Uh, there is a career fair, a virtual career fair happening at the University of Johannesburg, and those are login details. It's taking place today and tomorrow between 10 and 3 o'clock. If you are interested in our FEM, by all means, um, you know, go on, log on, and you'd be able to attend this career fair uh, virtually. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vanessa. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, Vincent. Thank you, Bongi. Thank you, Bongi. Um, I'm sure our students, uh, I'm speaking on behalf of them, but I know for myself, it was just wonderful to get a practical side of everything we've read about COVID and all the 
um, the stuff that's been put out about how auditors should be responding to it, but to see how you have. And thank you so much for bringing us like real live examples. I thought the use of the UJ um, financial statements and, you know, the statements on going, going concern and the impact of COVID and the subsequent events, really, really, really fantastic. I can't thank you enough. We thank you for your effort. We thank you for your time and we look forward to hopefully seeing you soon at some kind of CTA function. Thank you so much. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Vanessa. Have a great afternoon, everyone. All right, cheers. Thank you. Bye. Bye.